Hello, my name is Christophoros Christofi. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be the host of this series of discussions that are hosted by the British High Commission in Cyprus. Today, I have with me a very distinguished guest, Sir Geoffrey Voss, Chancellor of the High Court of England and newly appointed Master of the Rolls as from January uh, 2021. Sir Geoffrey, welcome to Cyprus. It's great to have you here today. Thank you very much. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm actually in Nottingham in England. Okay. Uh, as I said, it's a great pleasure and a great honor for us to host you in this uh, uh, discussion forum. Um, let me make a, a small introduction uh, about um, yourself, say a few words, and then I will give you the floor to uh, present your um, opinion. Uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss has been uh, Chancellor of the High Court since October 2016. Prior to that, he was Lord uh, Justice of Appeal from 2013 and was also President of the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary from January 2015 to June 2016. He was appointed a High Court Judge in October 2009. He sat in the course of appeal of Jersey and Guernsey between 2005 and 2009, and in the court of appeal of the Cayman Islands between 2008 and 2009. Uh, Sir Jeffrey started his judicial career as a deputy high court judge in 1999. He has been appointed to succeed Sir Terence Etherton as master of the roles. Uh, with effect as from the 11th of January 2020. Uh, Sir Jeffrey was also the chairman of the Chancery Bar Association from 1999 to 2001 and chairman of the Bar Council in 2007. He took silk in 1993, practiced at the Chancery and Commercial Bar from 1979 to 2009, uh, both in domestic uh, and international uh, litigation. He's also, he was also chairman of the Social Mobility Foundation from 2008 to 2011. He was elected uh, an honorary fellow of the Gonville and Gaius College, Cambridge in November 2015. And of course, Sir Jeffrey is editor in chief uh, of the White Book. He's uh, also a member of the Law Tech UK panel and chairman of uh, its UK jurisdiction task, task force. He is Dean of Travel and Keeper of the Black Books for Lincoln's Inn for 2020. So it is an impressive uh, CV, uh, Sir Jeffrey. Um, and um, uh, we, we are very excited about your presentation. We are going to talk today about a technology enabled justice system. What does it look like? And uh, can European judges rise to the challenges of these uncertain times. So I'm delivering the floor for you to give us your uh, presentation. And of course, I will follow up with some questions so that we can discuss uh, the hot topics uh, that um, are very uh, challenging uh, for lawyers and the legal profession today. Christopher, thank you very much for that introduction. It made me tired to hear you uh, recite the things that I've done. But uh, when preparing this talk, I, I looked back at the talk I gave in Nicosia mm -hmm. on the 15th of June, 2018. And that was entitled English Law Underpinning FinTech, Legal Tech and RegTech. And I said at that time that the common law was peculiarly well adapted for use in e-justice and online courts. And I remarked that in an era when people can get every kind of service instantly or at worst the next day by calling it up on their smartphones, it's inconceivable that they will accept in the longer term the delays that are inherent in almost all justice systems. And that, I said, was why we needed to move fast to develop online dispute resolution before the millennials lost faith in justice itself. And I pointed to our court reform project that is introducing online dispute resolution for claims up to 10,000 pounds, for divorce, for guilty pleas in criminal cases, 
and for tribunal claims. And I said that we shouldn't think that commercial disputes will not ultimately follow. Mm -hmm. Taking e-justice and the developments in fintech, smart contracts, artificial intelligence, legal tech, and reg tech all together, I suggested that the common law was well placed to provide the underlying legal foundation to the new technologies without new legislation. Well, first of all, I should say it's wonderful to be back in Cyprus, albeit digitally. It's a shame that COVID-19, a really terrible pandemic, has prevented me making a real live visit. But I hope that I will be able to do that uh, very soon indeed. Since I spoke two years ago, technological developments in the legal sector across the world have gathered pace. COVID-19 has forced many courts to use remote video technology to undertake their hearings. Indeed, in the business and property courts of England and Wales, which I look after, and the Court of Appeal in England and Wales, in which I sit, We've undertaken more than 85% of our caseload through the pandemic. And we are still hearing most cases, including trials, remotely or using hybrid hearings. Other courts across Europe have been doing much the same. Details are recorded on Professor Richard Suskin's Remote Courts Worldwide website, established under the auspices of the Law Tech UK panel which Christophorus mentioned and of which I'm a member. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've learned from needing to move swiftly, in fact, almost instantaneously from face-to-face -to, -face to remote hearings, is that we can do without paper. Almost all of the hearings I'm now doing use PDF bundles. And I personally, in my office, not here in Nottingham, have many screens, but no paper on my desk. Uh, many courts have actually, though, simply been doing electronically what was previously done manually. Hearings can be transcribed digitally, they can be live streamed, the papers can be transmitted and displayed digitally. But all that is not changing the system for delivering justice, only the mediums used for communication and hearings. And as I said two years ago, I remain convinced that much more fundamental reforms are needed. What is required, I think, is a, a holistic look at civil justice more generally. And many of the things I'm going to say apply across all civil and common law jurisdictions in Europe. The number of civil disputes that ever reach the courts is absolutely tiny in comparison to the aggregate number of disputes that exist within society and business. Let me give you an example. eBay's Resolution Center resolves more than 60 million civil disputes per annum. You heard that right, 60 million. And in this context then, I want to address briefly four quick points. Uh, one about online courts, and one about integrated ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, and then high profile and complex cases, and finally, the technology, technological delivery of legal services. So let's start with online courts. Online courts provide an opportunity for doing things quite differently. The process does not need to be simply statement of claim, defense, reply, witness statements, experts' reports, face-to-face -face trial, and eventually judgment. Instead, the complainant can fill in an online questionnaire to which the respondent can respond point by point and issues can be identified immediately for determination. At each stage, appropriate evidence can be uploaded, mediation can be recommended, and undertaken as part of the process. Issues that arise can be determined as the ODR, Online Dispute Resolution, progresses. And if you imagine a funnel into which thousands of disputes are poured, the process of compromise, mediation, 
and issue by issue resolution will remove the vast majority of them before any final determination needs to be made. At that stage, a judge, yes, you heard me correctly, a judge can decide the best method of resolving each stubbornly insoluble issue outstanding. But extensive rules are not needed for such a process because the underlying program defines the approach that is to be followed. It should be infinitely flexible to cater for the circumstances of each dispute. And if rules are necessary, they can be high level and applicable to all species of online dispute resolution. Now, will individuals and people in business buy in to this approach? In our current online civil money claims system, a portal allows litigants in person to bring claims online up to £10,000. And we're finding it extremely popular. Millions of people annually buy in to eBay and Amazon dispute resolution, where the work is undertaken by algorithms. Public confidence is obviously essential, but there is no reason to think that online systems will not attract that confidence. So let me come to integrated ADR. No court system can cope with all the disputes that exist. And that is why so many European countries have large backlogs. Because where there's no confidence in ADR suppliers, there is generally a large backlog in the civil courts. Unfortunately, the availability of ADR is often patchy and frankly of variable quality. What is required, again, is a more holistic approach. Mediation should be available at every stage of the online court process, just as it's built into the ombudsman process. Mediation can be integrated into dispute resolution in all its stages, because different disputes are amenable to compromise at different stages. And although it's controversial, there's a strong case for making participation in mediation compulsory. At the moment, disputing parties are allowed in most countries to opt out of mediation. Mediation should in general terms be an online, low cost process. In small disputes, there's no reason why algorithms cannot be used to suggest compromises to the parties. Protection is needed for vulnerable disputants in all online processes, certainly in mediation. But that does not mean that the bulk of disputes cannot be quickly resolved by online mediation. So thirdly, I come to high profile and complex cases. As you'll know, the UK is a popular destination for high profile commercial litigation. It comes to the business and property courts. And these cases often involve no UK party. They take a long time to resolve finally often two years or more from start to finish, that's not unusual. And trials in the business and property courts are frequently lengthy. But as I'm going to mention in a moment, there is not much incentive for the lawyers undertaking these cases to change the system. Long cases are expensive for the parties and beneficial for the lawyers. In my view, even the most complex and high profile cases could be resolved more quickly and at lower cost and more efficiently with the help of legal technology. The current UK system, which you operate in Cyprus too, originated in the 19th century. It needs a total rethink both in the UK and in Cyprus. And I know that you're in the process of that reform and modernization and that Lord Dyson has been involved with that work. But I am talking about something more extensive. To give you a few examples, we've introduced a disclosure pilot so that disclosure is now only required when it is truly necessary in the interests of justice. But still more radical reform is needed. Pleadings in big cases are lengthy and costly. And frankly, they are often never referred to at trial. The whole process should be directed as for online dispute resolution, 
at identifying and then resolving the factual and legal issues that actually separate the parties. Now, of course, reform will only work if the public and national and international businesses and lawyers have confidence in them. But businesses don't want to spend money and valuable time on dispute resolution. A more streamlined, flexible process would surely attract the support of litigating parties. Now, as editor-in-chief, as Christophorus mentioned of the White Book, I have called for a reduction in its size and for a simplification of the civil procedure rules in England and Wales. In Cyprus, you are lucky in a way to use a shorter version of the rules of the Supreme Court from 1958 and the even shorter White Book published in 1954. These rules come from a time before the exponential growth in our rules. The expansion of online dispute resolution for an ever larger cross-section of cases should give rise to a change in culture and lawyers and litigants will get used to starting and progressing cases digitally. The greater flexibility available as a result of judges, lawyers and the parties being able to communicate online at all stages of a case will reduce the need for the prescriptive rules under which we now operate. There are issues, of course, about data storage and data use but these issues affect every aspect of government and business. In general terms, I can see the practices that we create for small scale online dispute resolution, expanding to apply equally to high profile and complex cases. It may be, of course, that these cases will ultimately result in a face-to-face -face trial to resolve the final issue. But I think by then, will have got away from routine lengthy trials with dozens of people gathering at great expense for weeks on end in the same courtroom to resolve a commercial dispute. So finally, I want to come to the technological delivery of legal services. How then is all this likely to affect the way in which lawyers deliver legal advice? The uptake of law tech has been slow, frankly. Over the last 20 years, we could have been using video conferencing for hearings. We could have been using database programs to undertake disclosure. We could have been developing law tech solutions to digitalize the drafting of contractual documentation. But generally, we were not doing any of these things until the terrible COVID-19 pandemic jolted us into action. I've repeatedly asked myself how so many law firms have managed to shun the new technologies and deliver legal advice today, much as they did when I entered the legal profession in 1977. I think the answer is connected to something I said earlier. In 1977, we used typewriters and Tipex. Now we use computers and cloud storage for documents. But the process that lawyers use for drafting documents, for litigating, and for delivering legal advice is the same as it ever was. I know the law reports are online, and there are regrettably many more of them than there used to be. But reading and analyzing them is still the same process. And this will only change when the underlying systems change when litigation is conducted, as I'm suggesting, online with interactive sessions between judges, lawyers, and parties, and when the documents that need drafting are written in computer code so that the transactions are affected through smart contracts. And at that stage, legal advice will still be needed, but lawyers will have to engage more completely with the technology that delivers both transactions and dispute resolution. So what's the conclusion? Well, none of what I'm suggesting is far away. No commercial lawyer can expect things to remain as they are for long. Smart contracts, crypto assets, FinTech, RegTech are where the future lies. 
I am beginning to see signs that the legal community is starting with a younger generation of lawyers to whom these concepts are second nature is starting to embrace the brave new world. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeffrey. It's, a, it's a really interesting, uh, um, the things that you, that you told us and the new ideas that you floated around. Um, of course, we are uh, at the moment in an uncharted territory, right? Because of this pandemic. And would you agree that in a way we were forced to implement uh, changes in the legal system, both uh, as regards access to justice and uh, delivery of justice because of this? And had it not been for this pandemic, things would move a little bit differently and slower. That could be so, although I don't think we were forced into changes. I think we realised, certainly in, in England, mm -hmm. um, that we wanted to keep the justice system going and that technology provided a way for us to do so. But as I said in my talk, and I think it's important to understand this, the use of video hearings is simply doing technologically what we previously did face to face. It is not changing the system because the system of having a hearing in the first place is still the same. And yes, but we, now, yeah, can I interrupt you? Yeah, finish, please. Well, all I was going to say was what we need to do now is to grasp the opportunity that has shown us how we can use technology to do things differently to look at the underlying system. Yeah, but isn't the system, at least the common law system, I would say that it's it's built on, on the on the basis of human interaction, isn't it? I mean, the the fact that you have a live trial, you have the witnesses, you cross-examine the witness, and I'm wondering, Sir Jeffrey, how would a judge be able to to determine the credibility of a witness that is lying if that is done via Zoom or Skype? It's certainly possible. We're doing it at the moment. We have live trials, including witness trials, even where credibility is at stake, um, undertaken across Zoom uh, or Skype. But it may not always be the best method. I quite mm -hmm. understand that in some cases, a face-to-face -face hearing is, is really important, particularly where vulnerable people are involved and there are other reasons uh, where it's important, sometimes imperative. Mm -hmm. But I'm still talking about the underlying systemic change, which is not to assume that the common law system requires the same method that we've always used to be used in future. And I think technology offers opportunities which we have not yet taken full advantage of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that, that we haven't taken full advantage. However, I'm a little bit skeptical about all this um, new technologies. You mentioned eBay, for example, and the thousands of cases that are decided. Of course, there is a, it's something different, isn't it? The, the consumer doesn't have many options. I mean, going to court is not an option for money reasons, for time and whatever. So, um, uh, I mean, doesn't this eventually lead to denial uh, of justice if, if we force uh, people to enter into these AR, artificial intelligence systems, and um, hand over the, the, the task of, of, of delivering justice from judges to machines? Well, I think it's quite the reverse. I think there is every kind of dispute, civil dispute, starting at 50 euros with your electricity company, or 100 euros with your neighbor, and ending up with 100 million euros between banks and financial services institutions or the governments of countries. And you cannot treat the 100 million euro dispute in the same way as the 50 euro dispute. And there's a reason for that, uh, Christopher, which is important, I think. And it is this, that actually there's a three-dimensional graph between cost, the, how much people want to spend on resolving a dispute, and the time it takes to resolve a dispute, and the outcome that you obtain. 
And I've said this many times, but it's important to understand it. If it's a 50 euro dispute, you don't want to spend any money. You don't want any delay, but you actually don't mind so much if you lose. If it's 100 million euros, you don't mind spending quite a lot of money. You don't even mind a bit of delay, but you care very much if the wrong outcome is reached. And in between that, there's an infinite scale of different cases. And we must make sure that we cater for all those different types of case. And there's nothing wrong with artificial intelligence for the 50 euro case, because people vote with their feet. They use eBay quite happily. We must offer justice, of course, but we must offer proportionate justice. Yeah. Uh, in, in your proposal, you talk about online courts, uh, and you say that the process does not need to be statement of claim, defense reply, and all these things. So apart from the fact that you are negating the role of lawyers, I won't discuss this. You will leave us without a job. <laughs> but you don't, don't you need a process? Don't you need a, a specified procedure so that everybody knows what the rules are? I mean, the way it, it's written here, it is as if it will be decided by a judge on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, even, even the procedure. I mean, of course you need rules. Um, but you don't necessarily need rules in a very large book of which I happen to be the editor in chief with mm -hmm. thousands of pages, which ordinary people can't understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the process is not for the benefit of lawyers. The process is for the benefit of delivering justice to individuals and business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's not working for the individuals delivering access to justice in a discernible time frame at an appropriate cost, then we need to consider changing it. Mm -hmm. And that's my point. And, and just to pick up on what you said about lawyers, I am absolutely not uh, uh, trying to do lawyers out of a job. Indeed, as everybody knows, I was a lawyer myself for 32 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that lawyers can continue to do what they've always done without taking into account the technological changes that have occurred mm -hmm. and the changes mm -hmm. in people's expectations brought about by those technological changes. I mean, the mobile phone that we all use has made critical differences to people's expectations. Mm -hmm. So uh, your proposal is that at least for the online courts, is it for small claims only? I mean, do, you, do you make this differentiation or not? I think it uh, must start with small claims um, and we will see how it works. That's what we're doing in the UK. We're, mm -hmm. we're dealing with small claims, money claims online. It's mm -hmm. been very popular and it's working very well. Is it it's successful as well? I mean, extremely successful. Um, very few cases get to a, a disputed um, hearing at the end of it, but some, the ones that need to, of course, still do. So there's no mm -hmm. denial of justice and the lawyers are not kept out of the process ultimately mm -hmm. if they mm -hmm. need to be involved. Yeah, but yeah please. You carry on. Yeah, uh, I will take you somewhere else. Um, you say uh, that in, in the mediation part of your uh, proposal, you say that we should integrate mediation at every stage in the process. I mean, is, the, is this realistic? Um, if you have a high profile case in, in London, in a London court involving millions or billions of, uh, of euros, how are you going to integrate mediation, for example, at the hearing stage or when the pleading's closed? I mean, funnily, I, I, I mean, funnily enough, uh, mediation is often more successful in the biggest claims and tends to be more formal and tends to be undertaken by a professional paid mediator. But there are more, there is more than one kind of mediation and ADR. Mm -hmm. I think mediation covers a, a lot of different concepts. Mm -hmm. My view is that every dispute has a time when it is amenable to settlement. There are some cases that are completely unsettleable at one time and easily settleable at another time. 
And the system needs to be sufficiently flexible and actually um, adjustable to make sure that the, it can understand that and offer mediation or offer ADR or offer early neutral evaluation or offer some other process which will crack it if it is able to be cracked. The online dispute resolution process is a very good um, addition to our armory of tools. And within that process, we offer mediation at the moment. And it's a, a mixed process, mixed, mixed success rate. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes people don't take it up. I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of offering mediation. I don't know whether um, it's appropriate to make mediation compulsory. And as I say, what you mean by mediation is important. Uh, mediation for a big multi-million pound dispute in the business and property courts is a very different concept from the kind of mediation in a money claim online. Mediation in a money claim online, a, a claim for a thousand pounds or a thousand euros, um, might just be, why don't you take 500? And that just somebody even a machine suggesting why don't you take 500 might be enough to to get rid of the whole case so <laughs> i think it's it's very important to maintain an open mind about what kind of alternative dispute resolution becomes part of an online system mm -hmm. okay um you say that uh, you, you mentioned uh, a disclosure pilot uh, when talking about the high profile cases. Um, can you give us a little bit more details about this? I mean, you have excluded disclosure altogether from the no, process. No. Disclosure pilot uh, has been going now for two years. We've just extended mm -hmm. it for a year and it applies only at the moment in the business and property courts. It, mm -hmm. It's been, it, it's had a mixed success story. It's not popular with everybody. Um, the, it, it produces a little more work for the lawyers at the beginning of the case because they have to decide which disclosure model is appropriate for the case and what are the issues for which disclosure is required. But actually, it's a very important example of a new flexibility within the dispute resolution process because it enables the parties to come to the court and say, actually, this is a legal question, there's no need for disclosure. Or, this is a case where we accuse the other side of lying, we need full-blooded, old-fashioned, Peruvian guano disclosure. And something in between, because in many cases, you need really detailed disclosure about one tiny issue, like what happened at the meeting of the 14th of January, but you need no disclosure about anything else. So the court can be flexible in that way, save the parties what in the old days would have cost many, many uh, pounds, and also do justice. So, uh, Sir Jeffrey, do, do you envisage a situation in the future where the, the human judges will be uh, eliminated completely and decisions will be taken by machines and AI? Not really. I think that uh, AI is an extremely useful process, as we see with the eBay Dispute Resolution Center. They resolve 50 million cases a year, very small cases, very satisfactorily, and I'm sure they don't have any human judges at eBay's headquarters. But in the case of big cases, um, judges, I think, have a very bright future, Christopher, because mm -hmm. it's all a question of confidence. Um, AI is a wonderful thing, but I doubt that many people would have confidence in AI deciding cases, for example, in family law about what should happen to their children, or in criminal law about how long mm -hmm. people should spend time in prison, or in commercial law about what should happen to their 100 million euros. So I think we're a long way from robot judges, but I'm equally certain that technology can give a vast amount of assistance, which we should embrace 
to both lawyers and judges. So, Jeffrey, I would like to take advantage of your experience as a judge for so many years. So does it, does it really make a difference for a judge when he listens to oral argument face to face with a lawyer in comparison with a Zoom or a Skype call? I mean, we lawyers believe that by being present and by, you know, with the, our expressions, our, our, uh, our whole presence in the courtroom, sometimes we may convince the judge uh, rather than not. So what, what do you think about this? Well, I think it's about the quality of the arguments uh, rather than uh, the, the presentation of the picture. No, okay. the quality of the picture uh, <laughs> that you're looking at. But I agree that um, exchanges conducted face to face can be a little quicker and they can um, sometimes uh, bring out um, uh, issues uh, in a slightly different way. I think it would be wrong to suggest that Zoom is exactly the same as face to face. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think Zoom works incredibly well. And in many cases, it's just as good. In some cases, it's not quite as good. Uh, but I don't think it would affect ultimately the outcome. It would simply mean perhaps that it took a little bit longer um, to achieve the same objective via Zoom than it would face to face. The quality of the modern programs, and we're now devising programs that are purpose built for the justice process, is incredibly good. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm looking at your picture here. And honestly, I don't think I could gain any more from your facial expressions if you were in a courtroom. You're actually closer uh, to me than you would be in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. And I have a very clear idea of what you're saying and how you're saying it. So I, I think you should be careful about thinking that face-to-face -face is the only way to do anything. For some cases, it may still be certainly necessary for vulnerable people, as I said and for situ certain situations. But there are many, many situations where remote hearings produce an exceptionally good result. In a few years, the lawyers and judges, will they have to have an IT degree as well in order to understand what is going on with the cryptocurrencies, the smart contracts, and all these things that uh, you mentioned? No, I don't think so. I think understanding um, concepts of new technology does not require a, a degree in technology. It, it requires, uh, for example, to an understanding of the concepts that the technologies are using. And uh, lawyers have dealt for years with um, many scientific and technological aspects of modern life without having a degree in technology. But I do think that they have to stop uh, lawyers have to, to, to make sure that they are not intimidated by these apparently difficult concepts because mm -hmm. the concepts are really not that difficult. Mm -hmm. The blockchain, uh, the distributed ledger technology, which mm -hmm. everybody seems to find quite difficult, is simply a record kept electronically rather than on paper by a series of computers. And mm -hmm. all those computers keep the same record. And once they have that same record and they've checked it with each other, it becomes unchangeable or immutable. Now, that's not a difficult concept for a lawyer to understand. And all I'm really <laughs> saying, all I'm really saying is that you will need as lawyers to get to grips with those concepts because your clients will be using them for multiple purposes. And if you didn't understand them, you wouldn't be able to serve your clients as well as you should be serving them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and a couple of questions uh, about the human rights, uh, Chancellor, and about um, the right of access to justice. Uh, all, all these things, uh, do you see uh, these rights uh, to be affected or changing in view of all this? Uh, the pandemic, the way justice, um, uh, the delivery of justice changes, the access to court. Um, 
So, for example, with the online courts, presumably only someone that knows how to read and write and uh, knows how to use a computer will have access. If someone is illiterate, well, I think I think you're raising two different questions. Uh, the first question is: Has the pandemic and has the increasing use of technology improved or adversely affected um, access to justice? And the answer is that it has improved access to justice and will improve really? access to justice because more people will be able to vindicate their legal rights by using online dispute resolution, by using remote technology rather than having to travel many miles to a court, and by being able to communicate instantly rather than needing to take a lot of time to communicate with lawyers or the courts or the judges. Mm -hmm. But the second question about vulnerable people is a very important one. Um, in all the systems that we're creating in the UK, we are very concerned to ensure that the digitally disadvantaged are catered for. We are not abolishing paper for them. They will still be able to communicate with the online system through paper if they need to, through assistance by people who are uh, computer literate, as, as we did for illiterate people in the days of paper technology. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the, the two questions are, are quite different, but I am reasonably confident that technology will ultimately result in a considerably improved access to justice for individuals and businesses alike. Uh, Jeffrey, I would like to thank you so much uh, for uh, the time and the contribution and the valuable uh, uh, ideas and proposals that uh, you presented to us. It's, it has been really a great honor. I would also like to, to help to to thank the British High Commission in Cyprus for providing the venue and, of course, the access and the contact uh, to you. Um, I, I do hope that we will be able to repeat this and discuss your uh, proposal and statement on crypto assets and cryptocurrency which, and smart contracts, which I found very, very interesting. Leaving all those new concepts aside, it's really a great pleasure to feel back in Cyprus for just a short time. I really hope I'll be able to be physically in Cyprus very soon.